Recording in progress. Hello. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody, and welcome to our workshop. I'm Cristina Royo, head of the International Marketing Department at the Romanian Academy Library and member of the Standing Committee of IFLAS Local History and Genealogy section, which is offering you this workshop. Welcome, everybody, again. We want to present you here a lot of interesting examples about storytelling, about how we can use social media channels to engage communities with our projects and many other interesting things. We are recording this session and also if you have questions or comments, you can use a Q&A section and we shall answer your questions at the end of the workshop. And now, I am very happy and honored to introduce um, Elwin Collinson. Elwin is um, working now at Digital Scholarship at University of Oxford, and he used to work at the Museum of London. He's also the creator of the fabulous project developed on Twitter platform, Real Time World War II. So he is a real innovator in communicating history to, uh, to the larger public. And we are very honored to have him here. So we invite Thank our Thank you very much indeed, Christina. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so uh, just give me a moment, please, and I will begin. Right, thank you very much everyone for uh, tuning in today. Uh, my name's Alvin Collinson. Uh, as Christina says, I run a uh, project called Real Time World War II. Um, which is uh, focused on uh, using social media, primarily Twitter, uh, to uh, tell the events of the past. Um, I'm just going to see if I can move this Zoom bar, so it's somewhere less intrusive. Um, so this uh, talk is called From Warzone to Web. Uh, it's about real-time World War II and storytelling on social media. I hope some of the lessons here will be applicable to other formats. Obviously, Twitter uh, has a fairly restricted audience. Um, this project was started when uh, Twitter was new and exciting and a, uh, a vivid social platform to uh, kind of explore things and share fun things with our friends, uh, which tells you how long ago it was. Um, uh, but I just want to mention before I begin that this presentation may uh, feature some distressing images, uh, including some uh, depictions of human remains because it's about the Second World War. Um, so if that's a problem, um, please do try and uh, listen in if you prefer not to see. Um, but I just wanted to flag that up. Um, so, uh, as Christine says, I used to work at the Museum of London, uh, creating digital content and helping to publish the museum's collections and share them with a wide audience. Uh, now I work at the University of Oxford in our digital scholarship initiative. Uh, you can see there our um, beloved octopus, the Oxford octopus of knowledge, spreading its tentacles uh, digitally across the uh, both the university and the world, although neither of these are associated um, with the real-time real World War II project. So, here it is. Um, it's been going since 2011, uh, which uh, for the uh, uh, sort of whip smart history nerds amongst you may have noticed uh, that that means it is um, already past the length of the Second World War. Why does that matter? Well, um, the idea of this project is that each day um, posts a new series of events on the uh, 82 years to now to the day they happened uh, and that it goes day by day through the Second World War. So for example, my first ever post on here was about the Nazi invasion of Poland on the 1st of September, uh, 1939. Um, then the second day was the 2nd of September and so on and so forth of six years through to the end of the war. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, this means that I'm now almost through two iterations of the war uh, because uh, after doing it the first time, I decided to go all over again, uh, which is a decision that uh, I continue to question, uh, not least revolving around my sanity. Um, it's now got about 500,000 plus followers on Twitter. That's grown in kind of fits and starts over the course of the 11 years. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, just to give you a sort of sense of uh, what sort of things are popular, I look back at some of my most engaging um, posts uh, over the past um, few uh, months. Uh, so this was uh, this month, August. Um, it is 
I will say I don't really know if this tweet is intended to be representative of uh, my work because one of the reasons I started this idea of telling the events of the Second World War day by day uh, was that I tried to give a kind of eye level view, um, a kind of experience of the Second World War uh, as it might have been for some of the participants to go through it. Um, rather than kind of having arrows on maps, uh, I wanted to move away from that, engage a younger, uh, hopefully more diverse um, audience into military history, uh, one that would not necessarily be interested in kind of big troop movements or even necessarily in traditional things like the weapons of war, but more in about the human stories and the uh, perspective and narratives uh, that underpin the Second World War. I also, as I said, wanted to try and reach out to beyond um, a traditional male, older, um, more Western audience to tell a variety of narratives. This, after all, is a Second World War um, and one that had a huge presence uh, on every single continent and across the seas and in the air. Um, and therefore, I tried to uh, give a voice to uh, representatives, uh, represent audiences that might not necessarily have thought the Second World War touched on them. Um, so including uh, lots of Asian stories that are normally not represented in traditional Western narratives, the Second World War, um, and try to do things like feature um, a uh, variety of sexualities. So for example, some of my material has focused on gay experiences uh, in uh, both uh, Germany and uh, within the US and uh, UK, uh, British armies. Obviously it's really hard sometimes to get uh, access to these sorts of sources. Nonetheless, this was my most popular tweet in August. And as you can say, see it's a tweet that kind of zooms out to take a much higher level view, uh, kind of really expressing the enormous destructiveness and um, kind of incredible scale of the Second World War and the Eastern Front in particular. Um, then we kind of zoom into my most popular tweet in uh, July, which was a uh, piece, uh, no, actually, sorry, I think this one is uh, also from August, but um, this one features a, a kind of a, a really dramatic photograph. And I think that one's um, striking partly because um, it kind of juxtaposes uh, the very uh, striking and kind of almost uh, triggering uh, Nazi symbology uh, with the victorious Allied soldiers. Um, just to show that there is a variety of material and that um, some of the uh, content that I post and which gets really high engagement uh, is moving away from these traditional kind of militaristic and um, battlefield focused narratives. Uh, there's also more kind of um, fun and unusual material. Uh, so this uh, tweet here represents a young British RA officer RAF officer named Christopher Lee. Uh, yes, it is him, the famous actor, uh, sadly recently deceased. Uh, he's relaxing in Rome there in 1944. And um, this uh, picture got uh, enormous engagement um, and kind of reached out into a, a group of people who might not normally be necessarily interested in military history, uh, not just because it's a famous face, but also I think it's an interesting kind of piece of juxtaposition and underlines just how long uh, Christopher Lee's life and career was. Um, on a similar, perhaps, but more distressing note, um, here Here's a picture uh, that featured on in Life magazine, the US um, photojournalism magazine uh, in 1944, uh, which is a picture of a, uh, a Japanese skull uh, taken with uh, this woman who's called Natalie Nickerson. Uh, she was a war worker uh, in Arizona. I think she worked in a uh, armaments factory and her fiance, who was then on the Pacific front, uh, sent her this desiccated skull, uh, presumably uh, through the uh, US Army post or US military post, although I haven't been able to get much more details on this. Um, as I said, there are some distressing images uh, and obviously offensive language, but this again clearly struck a chord, not least I think because again it kind of represents a different group. Normally we see lots of photographs of battlefields, of men, of front lines. This is obviously far behind the lines and yet an interesting example I think of how the brutality and uh, kind of, you know, a, 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 a deeply uncivilized and um, kind of uh, racialist uh, action of war in taking trophies from uh, defeated uh, opponents, not least uh, then labeling them with racial slurs, enters into a kind of otherwise sedate Arizona life far behind the front lines. Uh, Likewise, I think that kind of taking some of those yeah, less represented narratives, and uh, this is a, a tweet around the death of um, a Soviet female pilot named uh, Yevgenia Rodneva. Uh, she was a member of the so-called Night Witches, um, which were a platoon of, or, sorry, platoon, a, a unit of all female um, Soviet pilots in the Red Army Air Force. And uh, I think that was uh, struck a chord in part because again, it kind of turns that perspective in terms of uh, who you expect to see fighting in the Second World War on its head. Um, 
So you may be thinking this is all <laughs> hopefully uh, relatively interesting, um, but is it relevant to the theme of this uh, session? Is it a local piece of history? Does it refer to genealogy? Well, um, obviously we're talking about a world war, so there is going to be a uh, an element which transcends the local, but of course um, the world is composed of many localities, and I hope that the uh, some of the elements I'm going to talk about, some of the themes that emerge uh, are, are going to be useful, not only in your own projects, but also um, show that the uh, uh, what appears to be a kind of vast and uh, world-spanning event uh, is in fact made up of individual stories and local histories which we can hopefully tease out during the course of our projects. So what is one of those uh, lessons which I think is applicable across lots of social media projects? Well, I think having a gimmick is an enormous uh, use, an enormous uh, feature. Uh, Real-time World War II has been featured in uh, places like the New York Times, the London Times. It was on uh, BBC, uh, sorry, uh, Channel 4 uh, Television News, which is one of the main terrestrial news stations in the UK, uh, and on other many, many uh, other media sources as well. Um, I particularly like this that the Atlantic did, which um, is the man who live tweets World War II, uh, which I think correctly captures in a headline um, the, the, the underlying uh, question here, which is why? Why would you do that? Uh, and it's a good question. Um, not one I proposed once now, I haven't got the time. Um, but broadly, I think that this news uh, coverage, which was enormously helpful in terms of building an audience and getting engaged volunteers involved, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in a moment, um, really uh, Sort of it really helps if there's a sort of simple story that you can tell about your project and i think that um the juxtaposition if you like of the uh, perceived completely unfairly perceived uh, image of libraries or museums or heritage institutions as being kind of old and stodgy and stuck in the past with the uh you know the vibrancy and the uncertainty of social media i think still has the potential to reach into local media uh perhaps television media uh, you know you can be uh, kind of having a hook for your project uh, can really serve to kind of um, spur an initial interest that is necessary to engage in a wider audience um, likewise, I've never used any uh, paid promotion on uh, Real Time World War II, uh, and I've never used any form of uh, follower buying or anything like that. Um, in general, I, 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 here's a kind of headline summary of some of my analytics from the last month. I thought they might be interesting. Um, you can see that the numbers have gone down, chiefly probably because I've reduced the number of tweets I've been posting uh, in the summer, um, summer holidays. Um, but I do think that uh, it's a kind of good reflection here of how you can achieve a strong organic reach on a platform without any post social without any spend that being said i think these days particularly uh, with an increase in the use of algorithmic timelines particularly away from twitter so using other platforms like facebook instagram tiktok uh, i think you have to face the realities that you may need to engage a hopefully small initial marketing budget uh, in order to um, get your content uh, or your project reaching into a wider audience but realistically you should never ever have to rely upon that in order to achieve um, wide coverage. Um, here's an interesting study uh, from 2014 um, but uh, it hopefully has applicable lessons here. Um, you can see the uh, link at the bottom here to uh, the researcher Martin Grandjean who <laughs> completely without my knowledge went and did an analysis of the engagement with my tweets in 2014. You see here there are four uh, different projects. Um, History and Picks which is a very kind of um, straightforward social um, optimizing account uh, which posts lots and lots of photos from lots and lots of different times and is kind of pretty ruthless in terms of trying to uh, maximize engagement. There's my project Real Time World War II and there's two um, uh, projects run by archives, um, one of the UK War Cabinet, which has the cabinet papers uh, from the Second World War. Um, and you can see here they're measured on a log logarithmic scale in terms of the engagement received by their tweets. And he estimated that my tweets received between, uh, in 2014, between 50 and 400 uh, engagements, that's likes or retweets. Um, I, I should say, uh, I think Twitter have changed the definition of the word engagement in the meantime, but um, as you can see, it's it's pretty competitive with History and Picks, which, as I said, is aiming solely to achieve engagement. And I think given the fairly strict limits of the uh, when I post material and what sort of material I post, I'm going to come on to that, um, I think, hopefully in a minute, um, there is a, uh, a, a kind of uh, an interesting de uh, demonstration there that um, material that's posted from a really from trying to be quite aggressively um educational is perhaps a strong term but um is fitting within a set of narrow parameters which is probably the same thing as all of your um projects that based on social media are going to be whether that's based on your local history or based on your particular collections and um, they can still achieve 
respectable kind of engagement. I think part of that is about building a community. And I'm going to talk briefly about um, how that happens. So um, I use Twitter in quite an artificial way. Um, it, I use it solely as a broadcast medium. But of course, social media is about having back and forth. It's about um, having conversations. And uh, part of it's about um, creating a set of followers who enjoy your content and your brand. Um, and one way that I think that's worked really well um, is if I look at the last uh, three uh, months most uh, popular replies, so these are the mentions of my account, uh, not my tweets, other people's tweets that mention my account, most popular for the last three months. Um, this one here is uh, talking about Operation Tiger, um, which was a uh, I had just posted about. This one is talking about um, an investigation into a, uh, a an explosion, the Port Chicago uh, accident uh, that killed um, hundreds of uh, U.S. Uh, Navy soldiers, most of them most of them black, um, in the Second World War. And this one is about um, Oscar Der, uh, Der Wanger, Wanger, who was the head of a notorious SS uh, division, um, a brigade. Um, all of these are replies to my tweets. All of them are giving more context. Uh, all of them link to Wikipedia. Um, and although the uh, um, engagement with the, although the, uh, uh, what you call the, um, the direct interaction with the tweets in terms of retweets and favorites is quite low on these, you can see they have high engagements. So they've received lots of clicks um, and or views. So I think what's really interesting here is that um, I kind of completely without intending to, there has been this kind of, group of followers who are happy to reply to my tweets, answer people's questions and give additional context um, in a completely organic manner um, and in a way that hopefully, obviously, gives um, a kind of useful service in terms of widening the uh, amount of information that's contained there. And I think this is something that we hopefully you can replicate in your own projects, perhaps with a more aggressive attempt to cultivate kind of high um, high engagement followers to add extra value and to serve as your ambassadors. Speaking of acting as your ambassadors, one of the things I was absolutely staggered by uh, in creating Real Time World War II was the emergence of um, other accounts that translated my tweets into other languages. Um, so there was uh, first a Spanish uh, translation, uh, a Russian translation, um, Arabic, Italian, Chinese, French, Portuguese, and Hebrew. Now, as uh, for the sharp eye amongst you might notice from uh, in terms of follow accounts and last posted, not all of these have kept pace. In fact, none of them is still tweeting everything, translating everything that I tweet. Um, but as I said, this was entirely organic. All of these people were volunteers. Many of them got in contact with me to ask for uh, clarification, context, permission. Um, I was really happy and I worked with these people while they were still tweeting. I wasn't expecting everyone to come with me for the whole six years. I think the Spanish and Hebrew teams did tweet everything beside me for the first six years, um, which was inspirational and amazing. And um, I think that's it's a kind of extreme example of how a, a compelling project, um, which uh, creates a loyal fan base, can then uh, encourage a, a kind of really extreme value add in terms of uh, followers acting not only as, uh, you know, kind of increased sources of engagement uh, and audience, but also as ambassadors taking out into communities that you might otherwise not be able to reach. Um, one of the things, of course, that this broad follower activity was able to provide was a lot of interesting content. This is a poster that was um, sent to me by one of my followers. Um, it's a very unusual poster because it's actually one that was never issued during the Second World War. Um, it says Stalingrad is conquered in Norwegian. It was made for um, circulation in, Nor in German occupied Norway. Um, but it was obviously never issued because Stalingrad was never conquered, not by the Germans in the Second World War. Um, and uh, this was a really, uh, I think, fascinating example of how people can bring sources of information to you. Once you go out to social media, you are reaching into uh, corners that are hopefully audiences that are hopefully uh, different from the ones that normally come to you uh, in your institutional capacity and which might be able to bring things to your attention that you've never seen before. Um, I will say that here's a kind of nice uh, contrast between um, followers as a content source versus followers as an engagement source. Uh, when I posted uh, this uh, poster, um, somebody replied with this, which I'm pretty sure is a meme that's been photoshopped to have Stalin kind of winning in it. Um, I, I think they did it in a good spirit. Um, Broadly speaking, I think this is one of the interesting things about this project is how much it's encouraged people to um, use the material in it for their own purposes, which is often making jokes, uh, which is kind of demonstrating the you know dramatic ironic knowledge in terms of saying that when Hitler says something about winning, then we know he's not going to, thank goodness. Um, but I think there's also this degree to which um, 
replying or engaging with these forms of uh, local history or genealogy or, or bigger history projects can become a form of self-expression where your content and your um, material, your, your archival material, will be remixed and played back to you in ways that you are not expecting and which sometimes might be a bit uncomfortable. Um, speaking of being uncomfortable, um, a, a brilliant way to um, uh, get engagement with your projects is to post something wrong. Uh, when someone is wrong on the internet, the internet likes to tell them about it. Um, you may be able to see here that um, I've called uh, this uh, photo, an extraordinary photo of Mount Vesuvius in Italy erupting during the uh, Second World War. Um, I said it was photographed from a B-52 bomber. Um, now, everyone who knows may know that uh, there were no B-52 bombers in the Second World War, there were B-25 bombers, but surely this harm harmless typo, this, this simple transposition of the two and the five will not lead to any uh, barrage of comments. Anyway, lots and lots of people tuned in to tell me I was wrong, but that's really positive. You know, that's a form of um, followers kind of adding value by letting you know when you've got something wrong. And I can tell you that when you uh, move into an engaged audience like um, history fans, you will inevitably get people who know the material, think they know the material better than you. And I like to think of those opportunities uh, those as opportunities to uh, first of all to build a relationship with um, those highly engaged and interested partners but also in order to demonstrate the value of crowdsourcing uh, by moving out by showing that you are not perfect as an institution or as a, as a certainly not as an individual and by um, kind of widening uh, the scope of uh, who can be involved in local history in, in in historical representation demonstrating that history does belong to everyone um, I've hit the limits of my time and possibly beyond um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to uh, listening to me and I look forward to hearing the list of the talks. Recording in progress. So <clears throat> thank you so much, Alwin, for this interesting presentation. Your long running project is quite an example. And many others have tried to do something similar later. For instance, the students enrolled at Masters in European History at the University of Luxembourg developed their own real-time World War I. But you are the first to run such a long real-time project. Thank you for your presentation. And now, we are moving to the museum's world and to Nadavi Gandhi, who is the creator and collaborator at, Dig at Heritage Lab from India. She worked with GLAMS everywhere, but mostly with museums as digital heritage advisor. Anyhow, the examples she will present us are very useful also for librarians. Something for so Nadavi, share us something from your Hello, um, I'm really glad experience. to be here and thank you so much for having me. Um, I have to say, um, Alvin, I really enjoyed your presentation. So I'm particularly nervous presenting after because that's such a wonderful project to learn about. And uh, I hope that um, I, I'll have something valuable to offer. I also must apologize in advance for not staying today because I have an emergency that I must run towards. So um, I, I will not stay for the entire duration today, but I will be happy to connect with anybody after this on Twitter or any other platform that you prefer. So without any delay, I will get um, right into this. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, social media storytelling and I'll try to focus my presentation today on Instagram. Um, so some of the internet live statistics tell us that people spend an average of six and a half hours online. When I saw that statistic for the first time I was a little mind blown and it uh, and when I and, and this was when I was developing a social media handbook on behalf of ICOM Germany and uh, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation in Berlin. And um, I started to wonder as to how can the six and a half hours out of all of this time that people on an average spend, how can GLAMS be a little tiny part of their day at least? Um, and how can GLAMS use this time to build connections with their audience, influence behavior in terms of maybe converting some of their readers or online audiences into visitors, subscribers, uh, donors, um, and also give 
value in valuable information that can be educational or uh, for researchers or anybody really uh, what is the value add in their day because there is so much content that we are exposed to in today's time so what can stand out really and also in today's time as rapid uh, response collecting grows is different kinds of online project goes what are the kind of ways in which we uh, capture this culture this growing culture today which will serve as a memory tomorrow so what are these kind of interactions that uh, can lead to that that glams can sort of approach and uh, explore an opportunity when it comes to social media for any other brand when anybody is using social media it typically moves in a format where you're looking at spreading awareness looking at engaging um, your audiences and and it can be at any point in your um, growth as an organization when you sign up for social media you could be at that stage where you're looking to engage people like for instance the met museum is huge they don't need to start um, a social media campaign on awareness building for them it could be like a different stage for a museum that is new or it's opening doors maybe it would be awareness so it really depends on where you see yourself um, as an institution but also in your social media journey what is your goal um, in uh, signing up for social media and making your presence felt on social media. And at the end of the day, uh, the kind of conversations that are happening today, uh, do we see glam institutions as, as, as having potential to influence their audience's behavior in a way that everyone can come together to create change? Or would it just be to consume information? What is the role really that social media plays in an institution's uh, communication? So that's something that um, whenever I work with a museum, that's something that I try to understand before starting a relationship with an online audience that what is it that the museum identifies itself as, where it sees itself, and how does it perceive it relationship going in the future with um, their audience with their intended audience and uh, the other thing the next thing that usually we look at is so many platforms today it just doesn't end uh, now there is discord that i'm told where communities are being created about you know interest related topics so there is always a new platform uh, what typically happens and what i always wonder is that we invest so much of our time our effort in creating content building relationships on social media but at the end of the day if there's a new platform and suddenly a particular platform that you've been using becomes a little less popular are, are all your followers always going to show up uh, the algorithm is messy there are a lot of challenges to being on a particular social media platform so how do you ensure that you're also leading your followers into a community space where you at least have a direct mode of reaching out to them whether it is through uh, collecting their email ids on a mailing list whether you have an online um, you know closed group like a telegram channel for instance so what are, what is it really where do you tell the story and where do you uh, keep that fine line between owned media and you know owned media or shared media where where do you draw that line that okay this is the amount that we can do on twitter or instagram but for the subscribers we are going to have special kind of stories because you also don't want to repeat so that's always a struggle in choosing what platform you want to be most active on especially because institutions are um so understaffed mostly and always facing a challenge when it comes to budgets uh, the next thing is again is that again what is the intention are we looking to drive traffic to the website if the museum is going to have an online collection portal and that's where we want all our audiences to go is it because we want people to sign up for an event or volunteering activities is it to generate revenue by selling merchandise uh, that a particular museum has uh, so really what is the relationship that we are looking to build on Instagram, for instance, it's it's always nice to have it very clear, um, write it in your bio, which is a small space, but it there has to be like a call to action uh, where you have a space for a link, which is very useful. You can literally redirect people to do something that you want them to do, whether you want them to sign up for something or you want them to look at web links that you've posted or an event that's coming up. 
And under that also there are these highlights, which I find very interesting because uh, again, a lot of museums use it for different kinds of uh, galleries that they have, but there are also museums we might see in the presentation later who would use it for, uh, you know, the kind of the different kinds of campaigns they're running or the different kind of initiatives that they're opening up. So really, it's about how you curate and think about your page and what it looks like to someone who probably does not know much about your institution. Um, so the point of social media and, and the word social is that it's with people. So it's like, I always say this is like entering a new relationship or I try to uh, equate it to literally entering a party where you don't know anybody. Uh, and now think about it. When you enter a party where you don't know anybody and you keep talking about yourself and you keep telling them about how amazing you are, uh, you're going to get a little annoying, I feel. So it's always nice if others are there to introduce you or if there are there are well wishers who are out there to share your story uh so you, so it's a little uh less awkward also and less self-promotional if i may say so uh, we always try that um our articles etc whatever is it is that we are promoting on behalf of a museum is also not just going out there as hey read this read this but also having um people with considerable influence share our content um, one of the things that I learned when I was new to Twitter was um, to actually reach out to a certain list of people who might want to, who already have expressed interest in the kind of things that you're posting about and sharing this that, hey, this might be interesting to you. And if you do find it interesting, would you mind retweeting this? Now, of course, these were more organic because uh, this article got picked up in a political conversation and took a different uh, route on the right. Um, and the other, of course, was written at a different time, but got tweeted out more during the pandemic when vaccines became the center of the conversation. So it was not intended as a timely piece, but became popular later. So there are always those kind of content pieces also that will, so the Diwali um, article that you see on the right, it trends every year we have the festival because that debate somehow resurfaces every year. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, an every year thing. Whereas the vaccine thing is more niche. I mean, not every day are people talking about vaccines. So what is in a hashtag? When we use a particular hashtag, we're not particularly looking at, um, you know, we're looking at people who might be interested in the same topics as us. And by aligning with a topic, uh, with a particular hashtag, uh, we also participate and become part of a larger conversation. So Museum Week that I had been part of in the initial years between 2017 to 20, um, uh, did precisely this. We tried to take topics that were very everyday, uh, travel, book, food, friends. You know, these are things that everybody talks about, has pictures for. And when we add museums to the mix, museums had even more stories to tell. So if you searched Friends MW, you would come to know about all the different kinds of friendship stories that museums around the world have. And also hashtags sort of help measure the engagement and uh, the, that's the analytics part of it. But it also helps the content being discovered by people who are likely to find interest in that. Uh, but Instagram, on the other hand, was a little more experimental is what we found. Uh, so for instance, we could host uh, a treasure hunt on Instagram. That's what a museum in India did. So this was also for museum, uh, for visitors who were not going to the museum. You, you didn't have to be at the museum to play the treasure hunt, but you could actually play on Instagram also by scrolling down and finding an object in their posts. That's probably not the screenshot. but. There's a gamification of um, an experience which is targeted towards a younger audience. But also on the left, you see is the Chandigarh Museum, which has a more, uh, which has a collection that has largely always appealed to scholars. And so their content and everything else had wanted to maintain that kind of, uh, you know, inputs on their scholarship, uh, on their uh, paintings as well. Uh, and, and, and campaigns like um, Museum Week helped both these kind of museums to be known for the larger internet, uh, to be known amidst the larger international community. Sorry about that. Um, on Twitter, though, 
we found it easier to tell stories with the community, not to share one way and uh, get get engagement. But again, this was a campaign where we we wanted to take a midway in terms of what, there, there was a there was a point in India when there was um, a lot of um, negative conversation around religion and a lot of hate speech happening. So we wanted to take a moment to reflect on thoughts of peace and Sufism. So Sufi Thursdays are these, uh, you know, in, in the concept of Sufism Thursdays is when you have music and folk, I mean, different kind of rituals on Thursdays. So we took it up as an online ritual and had people share different kinds of literature, story, experiences that they've had around Sufism, paintings. So there was a core of people who were continuously sharing these stories. And what was interesting is that the consistency with um, which we promote the campaign. So if you're consistent, I think that was our biggest learning from this campaign that if every Thursday and you know that you're doing this campaign for two months or three months and every week on Monday or Tuesday, you're reaching out to people to remind them that, hey, Thursday is coming and hopefully you will participate uh, on a personal DM. Uh, the conversation after two months, we realized we didn't have to do that anymore. And even after the campaign was over, people kept posting. So I think it is also because people start to expect that every Thursday is this and we must post this. And after a point, interestingly, everybody forgets who really started the campaign, but they just want to use the hashtag and share stories, which is incredible in its own way um, also. On Instagram though, we realized that the kind of conversations we had with our audience were slightly deeper. So um, even though on Twitter we saw everyone was picking up the hashtag and tweeting, uh, it's on Instagram and the different kind of tools that Instagram has, like the Q&A tool, for instance, helped us navigate the world of art history and sharing about art and also with collaborations. So for instance, this one was an exhibition that was at the Asia Society uh, New York. And this was about a very popular artist, MF Hussein. And in India, even if someone is not familiar with the art world, they still know MF Hussain. The idea was to have them come to the point that, okay, uh, you know, come to the point about horses because MF Hussain did paint a lot of horses. And the painting that was on at the um, Asia Society was about seven horses. So we wanted to drive attention to that and then explain the particular artwork uh, to drive excitement. Of course, this is also an audience that is predominantly Indian and the goal for Asia Society was not to transport people from India to go all the way to, to New York to see the exhibition, but it was their goal was to engage Indian audiences and also have conversations around this exhibition in India. So that was the perspective with which this um, collaboration was conducted. Um, similarly, I have really enjoyed how other museums uh, take up interesting topics to drive attention to a painting, take different routes to drive attention to a painting. So this was by the Asian Civilization Museum in Singapore. And uh, the first three, four stories lead you to talk about your own fashion sense, which is immediately engaging to someone. It's a question that matters to you, which, which style would you choose? And based on the color scheme, you're told, you're told that if you selected more A, then your style icon is this person. And you can find this painting in that gallery. So we found that this was a very interesting way to also um, popularize artworks. And again, that gamification angle comes in because people really love to give opinions, polls. They like to participate rather than just passively consuming the information that you have to give. So it's nice to find ways to have your audience um, chip in. This is another example. And this passes through different stages again. So uh, this is by the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt. And uh, if you notice, they first, it's, it's nice to actually see someone that probably looks like the portrait. So it's uh, delightful at the first go. And then they're uh, not directly selling you, uh, they're not saying buy this jacket or anything, that, that's not the point. But this is creating a certain kind of excitement in you that, oh, can I get merchandise? Then you want to DM them and ask that, do you have this merchandise? Are you selling it? So there's that kind of interest that you create. Um, and then there is 
uh, making it easy for your audience to share and giving them a call to action. So you're telling them that geo tag your posts, you're telling them what to do, what you need them to do, um, asking them to visit a website. So it's not in the first story that you see, but it comes after a second or third uh, sharing because you're already already involved in that stage. Um, there was also this kind of a thing that if you're not on Instagram and you're just starting out, how do you gain followers? If you're just like right now, just beginning, you know, you've decided to set up, but how do you go about it? So DAG Museums uh, was setting up a new account. And I think this was such an interesting manner in which they uh, collaborated with lots of different accounts on Instagram, which were known for art related, but not directly so. So for instance, they had, uh, they created all these different audio stories based on their paintings. So there's a nice script, a two, three minute uh, script where you talk about the artwork, which they shared with, I wouldn't use the term influencers, but these were very targeted uh, collaborators. So somebody's an author, somebody's an actor in theater, or somebody, I mean, uh, there are different people. Someone's a writer, someone's also a painter. So there are different kinds of audiences that DAG already had in mind that they felt uh, their content would be useful to. And so they collaborated with accounts to gain that, um, gain that visibility, gain that, uh, gain that uh, platform to say hello to everybody else's followers as well. So collaborations are really interesting, having people talk about their stories and creating short videos. Uh, similarly, we work with Archer Art Gallery, which is a gallery which had different paintings uh, about people. But again, we didn't want to talk about the artwork, uh, just, just solely focus on that, but we wanted to look at how these people have made a difference to India or how they have contributed towards the freedom struggle, thereby connecting people who are interested in history or have family traditions that align with, the, or, or have families that align with them too. And, and for two of these, uh, Babu Rao Painter and Sir Hukum Chand Jain, we actually, after posting their videos, had their families discover these videos and give us more pictures and photographs that this is so great to see my grandfather there, my great, great, great grandfather there. They were more forthcoming about information. So it in turn helped the gallery to actually collect more information about the people featured. Um, the interesting thing about Instagram is that it lets you, it's a lot of work, I understand, to create maybe 30 second reels to promote your content. But again, it's an audio visual platform. So it cannot always just be pictures. It's a little mix of different kinds of uh, content. And we've seen that it's interesting, even if you don't want to create it all yourself. Uh, so one of the things that Instagram in introduced uh, a couple of years ago was Instagram guides, which is a very interesting feature because you can club different posts as uh, different posts you've made into a into a particular guide. So we, for instance, use it for promoting different events that different museums are doing. So our uh, followers know that they can check the culture hot list to know what is happening in a particular week. Uh, similarly, a lot of uh, museums can choose to organize their posts into centuries or into art themes, different guides for different things. So if you want to say miniature paintings, that's one section of photography. So no matter what you're posting every day, you can organize it. Uh, it's like Instagram meets Pinterest in a very fun way. Uh, so it's, it's organized. People can directly go to a guide and find everything they need right there. And it's also nice because you can add uh, to a guide posts that are not your own, but also of others. So if someone else is posting about a particular time period and you just want to talk, it, it's like organizing your own exhibition online in a way, or like your own Twitter thread, or you know, just having seven it's curated content basically. Um, another one is reels. So what we do is we try to repurpose the content that we are creating. If you're doing a particular article or sending out a newsletter, we try to um, promote that in advance. So for instance, this is a painting which has different loves, love poetry from the Sufi tradition. So we'll play a little uh, bit of it. I'm not going to go to the whole thing, but it, you tell people that these are different kinds of 
uh, literary traditions that have existed. These are characters, show them a little, intrigue them a little, and then say that you can find out more about these stories on the website or in the newsletter, so in detail. So they know exactly what to look forward to or why they should subscribe to the newsletter this time because this particular story excites them. So I won't go through the full thing. It's, um, I'll go to the next slide. But again, on Instagram to uh, what is our goal? Is it that we were just trying to reach new audiences? Was it we wanted to create more engagement and sharing? So we always look at post insights that way. So is it a success because more people liked it or is it a success because more people shared it and saved it or commented on it? So we do try to keep and follow one stream, whether it was reach or whether it was engagement. We don't try to stress ourselves with both. And I try to tell museums also to stick to, stick to one kind of metric that they're really interested in depending on the stage at which they find themselves in. Um, because it's difficult to sustain the engagement given the algorithm. The algorithm meaning that it, it would change. You constantly need to be commenting on other people's posts. You constantly need to be sharing. You, because at all times, not all your followers are active, right? So you're, if you're active at most times in the day, you will target a certain set of followers at that point in time. So the idea is to also find that right balance, whether frequently posting works for you, whether ensuring that your audience knows that you will only post on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, does that formula work for you? Um, I'm slightly over time, so I'm just going to now just share that we have, uh, we usually try to see how our community is coming together by inspiring them through artwork and also using their opinion in building content so it's not always one-sided but asking them enough questions to inform the next set of um, uh, the next set of maybe whether it's an online tour or whether it is a, a well-written essay we try to take the audience opinion on it uh, with the view that going forward social media rests on the point that everybody is a creator right so how do we give them more material to create with um at the end of the day we are all stressed so we don't have a lot of time and we don't have a lot of budgets so we try to repurpose and recycle content uh this is the only part that i i think i really really wanted to share is like for instance we're doing this video conversation today and this will be on YouTube, I am told. Uh, but it could also be split up and just the voice of the people presenting, if it makes sense to take their voices without their slides, can be turned into a podcast. From there, it can be turned into an audiogram, which is a still image with sound waves for like a 30 second clip on Instagram. That way, um, all audiences on all different platforms are these are all directed to that one place where you have the entire video similarly for twitter we did this we created a thread which uh, said artworks that remind us how beautiful friendships are for friendship day and uh, we converted that into an article but we also converted that simultaneously into a carousel post on instagram so again if you're on multiple platforms um, I, I always feel that we can repurpose and recycle some content um, I'm, I'm really glad that we got to spend this little time together and I hope this was useful. If there are any questions, like I said, I'm happy to connect after. But uh, thank you so much, Christina and team for having me here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your patience through this long presentation. Recording in progress. Thank you so much, Medavi, for your interesting presentation. Very inspiring examples on how to engage audience. And I agree with you that we have to tell story with the community. Community must be co-creator. That's the way libraries should relate to their users. And of course, the other glimpse. And now we shall go and discover another project and see how we engage people with their ancestors' life and history. And Rene Rep and Bruce Ware will tell us about 
mariners of Sailors Knack Harbor history and genealogy uh, page. Um, Rene is um, uh, archivist at uh, Sunny Maritime College in New York, and Bruce Ware is founder and administrator of Mariners of Sailors Snug Harbor History and Genealogy Facebook page, and Find the Grave Sailors Snug Harbor Cemetery page. So, um, I invite you to tell us about how you Thank engage you so community much. in discovering the story you see the of screen? their ancestors. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm the archivist at SUNY Maritime College in the Bronx, and Bruce, uh, he is the founder and administrator of both the Facebook page and the Find a Grave for Sailors Nook Harbor. And thank you for having us here today. Uh, so let me make sure that this is actually, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a very, very short history of what Sailor Snug Harbor is. Uh, Snug Harbor is a term that is a cozy and comfortable retreat. You'll see this term a lot in a lot of nautical neighborhoods. Uh, and it was the first retirement home established for retired seamen. Um, it was established by the Robert Richard Randall uh, Will in, in 1801. And the site itself was opened in 1833 in Staten Island. There's an image of the campus here from our archives. Uh, it's currently... Uh, the Noble Maritime Collection and also the Snug, the Snug Harbor Botanical Garden and Cultural Center. So this, the site is still there. Um, but in 1976, uh, Snug Harbor had to leave that campus and uh, move to a smaller facility in North Carolina. And around um, 2008, they decided to close the physical facilities that they are still an active charity. Uh, and so at that time, they were struggling to find a home for their collections and their art. And uh, we found out, this was back in 2008, so librarians in, at Maritime College realized this was happening and they took charge and took those records. So the archives at Maritime, we have all those archival records and uh, the art is still at the Snug Harbor campus in Staten Island. Um, and off to you, Bruce. Okay, um, I'm gonna also talk a little bit about the history of Snook Harbor and then a little background information about myself and then uh, some projects that I created that are using the records of Sailor Snook Harbor at the SUNY Maritime College. Um, just to give you a, a, the scale of Sailor Snook Harbor, there were 10,000 merchant and naval mariners who resided at Sailor Snook Harbor uh, between the years 1833 and 1976, uh, when it closed, and then was sold to New York City, and then they had, uh, New York City created, made it a cultural center and put uh, various museums, as Renee noted, the Noble Maritime Collection, but there's a Staten Island History Museum. Um, it was a uh, originally 150-acre campus with uh, about 50 buildings. So outside of the residences, they also had a uh, music hall, uh, the second oldest one uh, in New York City behind Carnegie Hall. It was built in the 1890s. And um, it, it had farms that they turned into botanical gardens that are very interesting. So uh, today, about 80 some odd acres uh, still exist and uh, about 30 of the buildings um, they hired when they were built it. Uh, they uh, hired uh, some famous architects. Uh, Menard Lefevre was a uh, Greek uh, Revival architect, and you, that's what you see, the little photo there. Those are the uh, five front buildings uh, that were built in the 1830s and 1840s. And then there's a whole series of interlocking buildings behind it that they uh, had for the Mariners. There were workshops in the building, so a lot of these, uh, they were old and injured sailors that were in there. Um, they were from many different countries, which is interesting when you look in the records. Um, they weren't just from the United States. Uh, they, the requirements for Snook Harbor to get in was you had to be a mariner for 10 years and sail under a U.S. flag for five. Um, when you look in the records, I was surprised to see, even going back to the uh, early 1800s, there are mariners from all around the world. Um, the only other place that was similar, and I think they got the idea to, when they built Snook Harbor, was the uh, Royal Naval Hospital, I think, was uh, 
started in the 1700s in England. And uh, the Randalls were merchant sea captains. There was uh, uh, Robert Richard Randall and his father, Thomas Randall, were uh, the father was a, also a privateer uh, during the French Indian War, the Seven Years War. And also during the American Revolution, they were both privateers. And they were very good at it. And they became wealthy and owned a lot of land in Manhattan in New York City. And uh, they were very, they wanted to help uh, sailors. If back in the age of sail, um, if you got injured um, or you got old and couldn't work anymore, there was no safety net. And a lot of them became homeless. And uh, you don't see them in photographs when you see the photographs in New York City with all the clipper ships. But if you went in a couple blocks in, you would see a lot of them. So they wanted to help them. And so they came up with the idea the son didn't have uh, any children. Um, so uh, his attorney, the family attorney, was actually Alexander Hamilton. And he helped them come up with the idea to create a foundation and leverage their property and create a retirement home. So Alexander Hamilton actually wrote a will for the son. And when he died in 1801 and actually created a foundation, which is very interesting. Um, and then... Uh, the income from the property they owned, which is in the was in the Greenwich Village or New York City near Washington Square Park, became very valuable. And he used that to fund the not only the purchase of property on Staten Island, but also to build all the buildings and actually operated uh, for you know 140 years. Um, at the peak, there was about a thousand uh, mariners in the, around 1900, um, and then over time, as there was Social Security and pensions. The need for it uh, declined, and that's why in the 70s they sold and went to a small facility. Um, I'm actually a native New Yorker. Uh, I was born in New York City and grew up in the area and um, was not aware of Sailor Snook Harbor until I was researching my family history. And I have mariners, uh, my family, some of my family lines go all the way back to being in New York. So I'm, uh, I have a lot of ancestors from different countries and a number of them were mariners. Um, the mariner that I have, uh, I'm a descended from that actually was in Sailor Snook Harbor. His name was Christian Robinson, and he came to New York City in the 1830s from Denmark. And during the 1860s, during the Civil War, his sons are actually fighting in the Civil War. He gets injured, and he's older, and he ended up uh, moving into uh, Sailor Snook Harbor, and he died there, and he's buried in the cemetery. So when I found out he was there, I was like, what's this place? Friend of history. I couldn't believe I actually wasn't uh, aware of it. But Staten Island is kind of separated. If you know New York City area, it's an island that's about a half hour ferry ride from Manhattan. So a lot of folks don't go there unless you have relatives. So it explains one of the reasons why Snuck Harbor is not, is, uh, not well known unless you live on Staten Island. Um, but when I got, I found out they had records. I got it from the SUNY Maritime College, and I was shocked at the details. It actually had the town uh, in Denmark he was from and some of the ships he sailed on. This is unusual. Um, my background is uh, I've been uh, 20 years experience with genealogy and had uh, sailors are kind of hard to find a lot of times, especially if they didn't have families. They don't show up in censuses. Uh, and they're sailing all around the world. They don't take census of ships when they're sailing. So they don't appear until uh, some of these guys, until they ended up in Snook Harbor, because they did take a census of all the mariners in Snook Harbor. And uh, so I know it's difficult to find information about them. And I was, I was shocked. And then I realized they had information that goes back to the beginning, like the burial records. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like thinking that uh, all these guys are unforgotten to time. Somebody needs to do something about it, especially when I found my ancestor in the cemetery, which I have a photo there, which is uh, only has 6,500 mariners buried there and only 15 visible uh, headstones. Um, it's about eight acres. It's separate from the campuses and actually still owned, not by New York City, by the trustees, the foundation still exists. And uh, they sold those properties in New York City and have an endowment and still help merchant sailors to this day. So it's probably one of the oldest foundations in the United States. Uh, but they don't allow access to the cemetery at this time. And uh, so I, I decided I was going to start a project to research the records of these sailors. 
And where do you start? 10,000 Mariners, it's a lot. You know, it's going to take a long time. So I decided to focus on the cemetery since they had records going back, burials to the beginning, and focus on them. Um, so I started on my own uh, project. One is to do uh, research records, and the other was also to get access to the cemetery to put a memorial monument in to all the sailors there. Uh, they do have maps of uh, like the 1940s and 70s that kind of give you an idea of where the roads were. So that gate you see there on that picture, there's some paths. So I wanted to put a monument in there. I tried to get access before um, the pandemic. The pandemic came up and kind of, so I started this project before the pandemic. Pandemic started and derailed my uh, traveling to New York City to photograph records uh, and then come back and transcribe them. Uh, you can flip to uh, flip the slide. Okay, this is kind of just giving an overview. I decided to use Facebook and find a grave uh, on this project. Um, Facebook I wanted to use because I wanted to connect with other descendants and and actually get the word out about Snook Harbor. I um, have connected with seventy descendants. Um, and there's various ways. I wanted to use uh, Find a Grave because Find a Grave got purchased by Ancestry. So if you are familiar with Ancestry and you're building a tree, you get hints and you will get hints if it sees uh, a memorial that I created on there that has the name and the dates that kind of match up. It will give you a hint on Ancestry. So I get some folks that um, find out about the cemetery and start asking questions. So. I'm going to show you some uh, screenshots I've done of the Facebook page and Find a Grave and how I reference uh, each other. So folks that, uh, however they're coming through, if they're coming through Facebook, they can see there's links over, that there's other information, or if they come discover it through Find a Grave, then I'll start communicating with them and tell them to look at the Facebook page and then let, let them know that there's records at SUNY Maritime. Um, that they can get a hold of. And it's uh, always fun when they get the records. They're always shocked because a lot of times they've been, they see these are the people in their family history that they've heard stories about, but they can't find any information. So, in, you know, genealogy, they call them brick walls. And uh, when they find, get this information, they're shocked and they're so excited. And uh, that's always fun for me to help them. Uh, because I knew how I felt when I got the information. So, um, but uh, currently I've been focused on creating the memorials to find a grave. So I have, there were 6,500 of the 10,000 actually died and are buried in the cemetery. And I have 5,600 memorials created um, for the cemetery in find a grave. Find a grave is kind of by, by cemetery. I recently traveled in uh, the end of May, June to uh, New York City and to SUNY Maritime, I got uh, photographed the other burial records, so I'll get all 6,500 up in the next couple of months. Um, I've had other descendants that actually are helping me transcribe the records and uh, starting the memorials. And then I've also started photographing some of the other Mariner records that have the details that I'm going to use to build biographies of them that can be added to find a grave. They have a biography section. so. Uh, so it just, here's just, uh, there's, I also, it, you know, the, uh, as far as the cemetery is concerned, that part of the project or se separate project, I tried to get access before, talked to the trust and they rejected my access uh, requests. Uh, they didn't want, they worried about insurance liability concerns, which, you know, cemetery kids get in there sometimes and things like that. But um, I've, recommended that they donated to New York City. And I know they had some discussions before the pandemic. So hopefully, eventually it ends up that the city takes it over because they manage all the properties of Snook Harbor, which is very close to where the cemetery is. And then once they get access, they'll raise money and put a nice monument, like an obelisk that you see like uh, uh, for World War I uh, veterans monuments that you see, something similar to that or uh, here in the US Civil War, American Civil War monuments in there. Okay, you can flip the slide. Now I'm gonna start talking about, this is what my Facebook page looks like. Uh, this is the main page. This um, is a bird's eye view of a postcard that Snook Harbor, uh, they hired a famous uh, 
illustrator to do these bird's eye views in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this kind of gives you an idea what the campus looked like. You could see it's right on the shore so the sailors could see New York Bay um, and see the ships coming in and out. And they also had a big church, a miniature version of St. Paul's in London. That building was torn down, in, unfortunately, in the 1950s. But next to it is the uh, music hall. And then you could see they had a hospital and a TB sanitarium in the back there. Those buildings don't exist now, but uh, they tore those down. But you could see they had an elaborate hospital to help the mariners. And, they, and uh, back in the 1800s, you had a lot of tuberculosis in the early 1900s. And then they had housing for um, the folks that work there. They have some Victorian, a really nice landscaped area, and then the governor's mansion, that kind of thing. Uh, there's interesting connections. Uh, Thomas Melville was a captain, merchant captain. His brother, Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, he used to come visit. He was the uh, governor or director of Snook Harbor for 20 years in the 1860s through the 1880s. Uh, so there's uh, Mark Twain knew a lot of, there's quite a few notable mariners. They, they sailed on uh, famous merchant ships and naval ships all the way back to the American Revolution, all the way up through uh, World War II. So... Um, you can flip the slide. So this is just uh, some screenshots of, uh, if you scroll down my page, you'll see a, uh, I've got some information about it. And eventually you'll, another slide, you'll see the links that I referenced that folks, there's a wiki page on Snuck Harp if you wanna read more about the history. There's, uh, this shows you a, uh, on the right, a, this is, a person posting a telegram from the 1920s of their ancestors' death at Snook Harbor. And they're, uh, if you scroll to the next uh, slide, so they're sharing that and then they're inquiring about, you know, I got this telegram, old telegram, and we're looking for a great grand uncle. And we were told that, you know, some information that you're in the past about the cemetery and that there's no records, which I found interesting. I don't know who they're talking to. So I re reply back, yes, you know, from the burial records, this guy's in the cemetery. You could uh, flip the slide. And then on the bottom, I tell them that to contact me via my email address, and I'll explain to them how to, that there's records and how to communicate with SUNY Maritime College. Uh, there's some folks that, you know, they don't know if this is the person or not. Um, so I kind of filter it to figure out if they actually are. Um, I get, but these guys came from everywhere and the descendants are everywhere. They're just not, I'm kind of unusual that I actually, um, I'm from New York City. Most of the descendants are from everywhere. I mean, they're in the United States and other foreign countries. I have folks from the UK and Europe contacting me. Some, uh, some of these mariners were from islands that I didn't even know existed. And I'm, I'm a history uh, map person. Um, but there's a lot of whalers that were from Cape Verde, uh, in the Azores, and Pacific Islands, Samoan Islands, all over the place. They all knew about Snook Harbor when they sailed around the world. And, and uh, when they got older, they used to have a saying, I'll see you in Snook Harbor. And they weren't kidding. Uh, they knew it was a, a great place for if you got injured or you got old. Okay, there's another guy here. He's looking for some other information. Here's a post. Um, some of the descendants post, they have photographs. So here's a captain, um, his picture, and they wrote a little bio under there. These, some of these scroll down, so I try to condense it. It's kind of hard to see there, but, but she's talking about he was, uh, I believe, in World War I, and he starts talking about he was on a ship that got sunk by a German U-boat, that kind of thing. So they share stories. It's very interesting. You scroll down, you'll see some photos or so it's not just people that don't know some have but they don't have no there's other records and they, they get excited when they connect and get those records so it's fun when they have their own personal photos this is actually at snook harbor so you could see the church in the background here uh, so okay now as far as find a grave um probably some of your folks are familiar with find a grave uh, especially since Ancestry. It started in the U.S., but then it expanded. I noticed I was looking at some countries, how many memorials from different uh, countries, and it's grown quite a bit uh, since I first started using it. Um, so this is the main first page. You can, you can 
it's built around cemeteries, it's how it's organized, and then you create memorials for individuals, um, in which you have the burial information, but you can also, it has a bio, biography section, a lot of folks put obit, kind of obituary information in there. I'm using it to write short biographies uh, after I get the records and then do a little genealogy work uh, to figure out, to tell these guys stories, and that's what I'm using. So this is uh, just a just to show you what the site is. And then this is the Salus and the Carver Cemetery page. This is the top, and then there's just the photograph. You can see the cemetery doesn't have anything in there that you could see. Okay, you could scroll down. On this main page, on the bottom of it, I have a description that has some information about Snook Harbor, a little bit of, of where the cemetery is located and is first the campus. And then I also uh, mentioned a little history here about the Randalls and Hamilton of that. And then I mentioned that there's a project going on that, uh, researching with the SUNY Maritime College here about that. You can see here some other photos, one's the main gate, but this is like it's down a street, it's hidden out, it's got a red brick wall around it. You can't really, you wouldn't notice there's no signage, I'm working on that, trying to get signage on there. Okay, you could flip the slide. Now this is, if you go into, you want to see a list of those 5,610 memorials, here's just like the top. If you, you could search on an individual that's in the cemetery, once you uh, connect to say whatever cemetery you're looking at, you can type the person's name in, it'll just go right to their memorial, or you can just hit enter and it'll give you a list of everybody that's in there by alphabetical. So this is some of these 5,600, you can see I have the plot information, um, and the grave number that comes from the SUNY Maritime um, Snook Harbor death and burial records, which were uh, very, very good. I mean, they had a lot of good information in there. They had where they were born in there too. So I'm trying to put that, even though find a grave didn't have a way to bulk update that, had all the inf other information you could bulk update, but I'm going back through adding where they were born. Um, and the idea is once I get all 6,500 is to sort through by where they were from and then engage local genealogy and historical groups in those um, Muslim report cities uh, to see, uh, let them know that they're about Snook Harbor and if they wanna help write the biographies. So I like working in, with other people. It's fun to me to share information. And then also some of the local newspapers have the most detail when these guys died, even if they died in New York, they had a nice detailed obituary a lot of times in these, little small newspapers. Um, so a lot of times those are a good resource to write the biographies. Um, you could uh, change here. Here's a sample of uh, one of the Mariners. This, he's Captain Robert Sheffield. He's interesting. Uh, this is an engraving that I got from one of the, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see somebody posting this, one of the descendants. He um, was a American Revolutionary War veteran um, he also was a private, he was actually in the army for a while and then during the revolution and some battles and got wounded. Then he was a privateer and he got captured and he ended up on one of the infamous prison ships in New York City. When the British took over New York at the beginning of the uh, American Revolution in uh, 1776, they occupied it for the whole, uh, until 1783. Well, they took all these, some of them, the most famous is the HMS Jersey, took ships, boarded them up, and created prison ships and lined them up on the East River. There was uh, a dozen of them. He got captured, was uh, on the Whitby, HMS Whitby, which was a smaller uh, ship, but very few escaped. Most of them died. Uh, they starved or got contagious diseases, and actually 11,000 of them died during the war, more than all the battles in the war. Uh, he was one of the few escaped, and he was the first one that publicized it. He's, uh, the Connecticut, if you look, there's the Connecticut uh, Gazette has a uh, article about him and describes how horrific conditions are on there. After the war, he went back to merchant sailing, and he did pretty good. Uh, he was in New York City, and he ended up buying an island off Connecticut. Um, and the U.S. Uh, government built a lighthouse there in the early 1800s, and named, the island is named in his honor. It's called Sheffield Island. So this is just a sample of the bios that you can uh, create and enter with the memorial. And you can add photos. There's a little right here, which is interesting, I'm going to lead into, is there's a, 
uh, you can request a photo of the gravesite. If you click on that, if you go to the next page, this is how a lot of them interact, I find, is they'll see, get a hint on ancestry, or they're, they're searching around and they find this memorial, they'll go and request a photo of the gravesite, thinking there's a headstone there. Well, and then uh, you, if you're a member in that area, it alerts folks sign up, if they're a member of Find a Grave, that they'll volunteer to go take photos of the headstones or the grave sites, and then they upload them and help. I did this for a lot of mine. I have ancestors all around New York City and, and the surrounding areas, and, and uh, um, I've gotten a lot of photos of their headstones uh, by doing this. So... When there's a problem, they have a little flag here. You can claim it, a lot of folks, and then fill, fulfill it. That's what those buttons are for. In this case here, there's no headstones. The, the 15 already been photographed and uploaded. So the rest of them, there's no visible headstones. Um, there's various reasons for that. Uh, some of them, they used iron crosses, and they, sorry, they, when they had the problems, there were some more headstones, and they were taken out and stored in one of the basements of some of the buildings at Snook Harbor. But they really don't have much, uh, the, the headstones they used, uh, um, the information on there washed off over time. So, so I actually respond to these. Uh, you'll see, well, actually you can create a note. They can put some information like uh, some of them don't, they're just looking for a, head, uh, a photo. This one is, he's trying to see if this person is actually his ancestor and he put up some information that he has on it. So uh, sometimes they say, oh, I'm a descendant or I'm trying to find this guy, stuff like that. So there's a little note they can add to their request. Uh, I respond back to these, you see the red problem. There you go. And I'll put in there what the situation is with the cemetery and then, uh, so unfortunately there's no headstone, but if you're a descendant, there's some record, you know, we can engage. Here's go to my Facebook page to learn more about it. Um, and then talk about uh, the SUNY Maritime College, the records that are there. Um, some of it I talk about, uh, here is the Facebook page. Here's my email address. Um, so they start going over there. What I What's interesting is when I see that the count for how many here, I got 69 of these requests over time. Um, when I see that increment up, I know to go over uh, that, to go check for new requests, but I also go ahead and keep an eye on Facebook and, and not surprised a lot of times these folks see that, then they start posting on Facebook and then I start chatting with them. So you could see that's how I connect the two together. Okay, you could go down to the next and that's now I'm going to hand back off and talk about the record. She's going to talk uh, about, I actually show you samples of what some of the records are, but I think you can do this project with, um, I thought about in Cincinnati where I live in Ohio, there's a big uh, riverboat history and you have great books written about photos of the riverboats, but you don't really know who, who were the people that sailed on these? Who were the captains? Who were the crews? Well, you can do this kind of project um, with that by using city directories. In the United States, and I know in Europe, they have city directories that go all go back, way back into the 1800s or even 1700s, and they listed their occupations. So you could find who were mariners there and then go do something like this, where you can start researching national archives from merchant records, naval and uh, merchant sailing records. And uh, so I, you could replicate this. This is kind of unique that there's a cemetery with all these guys there that are forgotten that, uh, but you can also do it with military cemeteries. I have a lot of my dad's a military cemetery. You could do something like that with a project similar with that also. So I'm gonna turn it over to Renee, but thank you a lot. I know I talk fast. <laughs> I hope you could digest it. Uh, I recommend the links will be at the end and email addresses if you want to contact me to talk about it. But I look forward to a lot of these. I'm going to be researching when I get more down in it. I noticed in the records, it notes that uh, the U.S., what vessels they sailed on, but also if they were in foreign military navies. And I'm going to be reaching out. These guys are from everywhere to some of you probably um, to find information in those countries in their archives about these mariners which to me will be a lot of fun. All right, thank you so much, Bruce. Yep. That was really great. Um, so once these descendants um, get connected with Bruce, either on Find a Grave or Facebook, um, and 
a lot of these records aren't digitized yet. And sometimes digital um, collections can be a little hard to navigate. So uh, they usually come to the archives or they'll send me an email and ask for these records. And these records, um, they were called inmates. These were residents of Snug Harbor. Uh, they have more than just death and birth dates. They also have nation of origin, their religious affiliations, and um, other members of their family of who to connect to. So um, this is an example of those pictures. And so we're going to follow one inmate, uh, George Smith, when we wait for this little bar to disappear. Um, and we'll see his application to admittance, um, the registration page once he was admitted. We don't have uh, some pictures. We don't have all the pictures of the inmates, but we do have one of George here those death certificates, burial records, and also the cemetery map, which is much too large for us to, to digitize right now. Um, so here's an application. Oh, sorry, somebody just tried to call me. <laughs> uh, here's his application to admittance. Um, I won't read all, over all of it, but these are, um, I'll have these slides available if you'd like to look at them. But we, uh, we have a lot of information about George himself that a lot of genealogists will use. Um, and then we also have a nice blown up version of his a registration page and we can see his place of nationality. He's not from America, he's from Russia. And we can also see um, where he sailed, what items he came to Snug Harbor with, how old he was, um, and what what reason he came there. Um, and then unfortunately he did die. And this is really important for a lot of genealogists. They can see where they were buried. So as we can see here, George was buried at Snug Harbor. We have the plot, the row, and the grave. And if people really want to see where that was, we have maps we can show them. Um, but we can also see what items of clothing he's left, where that personal property belonged to, um, and also uh, there's sometimes next of kin on here as well, or somebody to be informed of that. Um, and then we also have these burial and death records. So this is, if we can't find the actual um, certificate of that, we can see if they were even buried at Snug Harbor or if they were buried somewhere else. And this highlighted section is the George Smiths that we're following right now. Um, so thank you for uh, sitting in. That was I had to really quickly go over that, um, but these are our contact information. I also included the wiki page, the uh, Facebook page, and also the Find a Grave. Um, so thank you all so much. Recording in progress. Thank you, Bruce and Renee, for your presentation. Well, it was like you offered us a vivid image um, of an old community. It's like they are still living. Very, very fascinating. And the lesson about uh, how people can find more information about their ancestors is also very useful. And now, since we are a section of IFLA, we shall hear from some librarians. How do they engage and what activities have they prepared for their audience in order to be more engaged? So, Can you see we my shall slide? hear more about the activities developed at the Qatar National Library from Latifa al Yes, al yes. Amri yes, yes. And uh, my name is Latifa. I'm Information Service Librarian at Qatar National Library. Today, I will share our experience as a librarian at uh, oh, QNL, um, how we adapt to non-core librarianship skill to engage with our users on Instagram. So I'm presenting uh, on behalf of myself and my colleague today. We are both Information Service Librarian. Just yeah, let me give you um, a background about Qatar National Library. Our vision is to be one of the world's uh, permanent centers of, for learning, research, and culture. And our mission is to uh, preserve our uh, nation and, um, and region heritage who enable people uh, of the state of Qatar to be uh, more influenced in the society by creating environment of learning. Yeah, so if you, have, um, if you have not been to Qatar and see Qatar National Library, so these are footage of our library. How amazing is our library? 
So the library is a 45,000 square meter building and located in the heart of Education City in the state of Qatar. Um, the space is open for all national and resident, uh, whether they have our membership, uh, they can use our services and uh, our building and rent, um, I mean, uh, book the um, uh, facilities in the library to use it for a study or research. So uh, we have a dedicated area for young adults. We have a children library, uh, instruction rooms, computer labs, uh, group study rooms and uh, media rooms as well um, and with two, uh, 200 seated special event area and auditorium and a restaurant and a cafe. So why at Qatar National Library we are using Instagram as a social media? Um, Instagram is the most popular platform in Qatar. Uh, is one um, most popular uh, between our target audience which is uh, youth and the target audience that we want to promote our services and uh, program are using um, Instagram. So we have a basic guidelines for our Instagram to comply with Qatar National Library uh, policies for social media. Um, so the tone uh, or the voice for uh, the post should be like friendly, informal, um, as possible as to be a first person uh, narrative as we, as, as or our. The language for all our posts must be uh, in both Arabic and English. And sometimes uh, if we have to use one language, we are stick with Arabic. So Arabic language will be uh, given the priority. Uh, we normally respond to all our messages within 24 hours or 12 uh, hours if we received it during uh, the weekend. Um, all the members or the team of social media uh, group have to be bilingual so they can um, answer the both uh, questions. Um, when one of the team are taking a day off or a leave, a uh, handover should be uh, given to another member and the second person um, who will be responsible for the social media have to be bilingual. So we are following um, best practice for social media. So we are posting frequently, a minimum three times a week, uh, two times a day uh, maximum. Um, we are using um, four images per post at the maximum and keep our caption uh, brief as possible, like 10 words in both languages. So the Department of Research and Learning uh, in, Qatar, in Qatar National Library uh, have 14 librarians specialized in different subjects that, such as science, history, literature, geography, uh, business management. Almost all of our librarians are talented, creative, and multi-skills. Uh, uh, also, our librarians are a lifelong learner, so always seeking knowledge through attending a professional and a personal training uh, program uh, yearly. So with the rapid change in technology I mean that the social media becoming more integrated in our daily uh, role as a librarian. Uh, thus our librarian needed to acquire a non-core uh, skills such as following the trends in social media, technology, graphic design. Uh, so most of our librarian or the group are working for the social media are keep taking um, social media training throughout the year. So um, the, the beginning of our Instagram, uh, we have a different Instagram because we are a big library. So we have the main account, the one on the left, started in 2012, uh, managed by the communication team in the library. And then later on in 2018, um, we started to do a separated account for different departments. Uh, and most of the uh, most of the separated accounts are run by uh, librarian. So uh, the the children library, the one in the middle, are uh, run by a librarians, and the heritage one as well, uh, led by the uh, librarian. So the main aim for the librarian lead account is to promote our services event, uh, help in understanding the user needs, uh, and promote for our uh, librarians work. So the, the account that I'm talking about today is QNL Engage. Uh, this is a researcher learning uh, Instagram account launched in 2019 to promote researcher learning program, services, collection, and database. 
So um, mainly we shift or we shift our attention to Instagram after the pandemic. So uh, we, um, the, the library, um, uh, during the pandemic and the lockdown, um, the library lasted around seven months close to people. So we shifted all our attention to social media and especially in Instagram to keep our user engaged with us. So we heavily used our Instagram to promote our services, collection and online resources. So the non-core librarianship skill that um, our librarian uh, uh, used to engage with the, with the users. So we develop our photography skills because we are at the social media team and a librarian who uh, do everything related to social media. So we don't have a dedicated person to do uh, social media stuff. Uh, we as a librarian do everything. We write the content, we do the photography. Um, we are following the new uh, strategies or campaign to, to see uh, what is new now and what is trending so we can uh, post it in our Instagram and grab people's attention. We are the one who are doing the content writing that content uh, in both language and edit the content as well. And we ourselves are doing the designs for the social media using Canva. So uh, the current trend we used um, during the period between August 2019 and April 2022. So we shifted our attention to Instagram Reel. We noticed that Instagram Reels are uh, popular and um, it's uh, easy to reach to um, a wider audience. Um, and Instagram Live as well. So when the library shut down, we shifted our program to be um, online or uh, on Instagram Live. So we get more engagement from our uh, users. Also, we are trying to follow the trending topics that um, interested um, that people are more interested in. So we can boast a lot about it so we can get more followers and um, get them engaged with us. And competi competitions are one of the most uh, popular thing that we uh, do on our Instagram so we can uh, grab uh, people attention. So in 2020, the highest um, reach of the highest impression that we reach is uh, 400,000. Uh, and um, the profile visit in 2020 uh, reached to 18. Uh, thousand and the content reach uh, 75,000 uh, and interaction with our uh, users reached to 30, uh, 32,000. So this is an um, analysis of our Instagram insights. So the highest interaction uh, we secure uh, last year was in January 2021. This is because we started uh, a live uh, in, in Instagram um, with one of the life coach, uh, a famous life coach here in Doha. So we noticed that our audience um, are um, loving uh, life coach and self-development uh, kind of topic. So we keep doing the same trend over and over. So because we know people are interested in this. So the same, uh, the same period also, we have the highest profile visit was also in January, the same period of the Instagram live. Our impression um, uh, reached 16,000 uh, in October, 2022, and our content reached the highest we reached was 4,000 in September, 2021. So thank you. Uh, for listening and thank you for having me today. Recording in progress. Thank you very much, Latifa, for presenting us this interesting Instagram uh, project developed at Qatar National Library. From your presentation, it is obvious that we librarians need to um, acquire all the time new skills in order to be able to cope with the um, uh, social media advance and be active and uh, and be innovative in this um, in this field. So, thank you.
And by the way, you have a quite a marvelous library. Uh, I haven't seen it before. It, it looks great. So thank you, Latifa, for your presentation. And now, uh, at the end of this workshop, I want to present you an interesting story very dear to me, the Flora Seville Adventure. As I um, told, as we started the workshop with the project developed on Twitter platform, here we have another one also on Twitter. I mentioned before, I am Christina Arroyo, head of the International Marketing Department at the Romanian Academy Library and member of IFLAS Local History and Genealogy Sections Standing Committee. But I am also a member of Europeana's Communicator Community Steering Group, which in 2020 proposed a task force, Europeana, a powerful platform for storytelling. Uh, we all know that uh, Europeana is um, um, Europe's digital cultural platform. And within the Europeana Network Association, we use task forces as a way of work around the topic of common interest. So why Europeana is a powerful platform for digital, as uh, a powerful platform for storytelling? Uh, we actually find this phrase in Europeana's five-year strategy set up by the European Commission. And besides storytelling, is nowadays one of the most important issues for cultural heritage professionals and not only. So we uh, quite an interesting topic. Our task force, um, we were 26 people uh, of very different background from 14 countries, so quite a large international group. When, and our common goal was to produce research and recommendations based on examples of interesting, engaging and effective storytelling practices found around the web, particularly those that incorporate cultural heritage. Of course, the uh, uh, obvious um, um, scope was to really make Europeana a powerful platform for storytelling, but also to help us in our daily activities as communicators for our, um, uh, for our cultural institutions. So how did we work? Without entering too many details, um, I can say that at the beginning, all of the task force members selected a few stories uh, we loved most and considered to be innovative. And we made a long list with 43 cases uh, with a lot of information about these stories. And we presented them in two ways, as spreadsheet or as Padlet. Here we have the Padlet, which is a more engaging visual resource where we have explained the reasons why we have chosen those examples. Here is the Padlet with all the information. But in the end, we have selected three cases to study in detail and to analyze in detail, uh, namely um, a close read from New York Times, a picture of change for a world in constant motion, Met Kids, uh, a project developed by Metropolitan Museum of Art, and You Are Flora Seville, um, a story uh, developed uh, by Egham Museum with a fictional character, Flora Seville. For me, as this um, medium, uh, this Twitter medium was very challenging uh, and I, I found this uh, story extremely interesting, I have joined the group that analyzed uh, this uh, Flora Seville story, uh, which was developed by Stephen Franklin, um, who in 2020 worked at Egham Museum. We see here the Egham Museum, uh, a small museum, but with interesting collections. So uh, this Flora Seville story is a Twitter choose your own adventure thread in relation to Royal Holloway University of London. 
And we have here two photos from museum's collection. And here we have the first tweet. You are Flora Seville, the year is 1887, and you are one of the first 28 students to enter the Woodrow's new institution, Royal Holloway College for Women. So how will your first day unfold? Just remember to stay out of trouble and avoid being sent to the principal's office. So from now on, we accompany as a user, uh, we accompany Flora Seville uh, in her daily activities. And in this tweet, uh, we know that we have to be ready at eight o'clock. And when the bell at uh, time eight o'clock, we either go to the chapel or we go to the dining hall. And every time the user has the possibility to choose what is Flora Seville going to do, which is very interesting. Uh, and this is how the content looked, the planning of the content with uh, 72 individual tweets, 27 separate threads interlinked. And um, we, uh, you can find more in Stephen's presentation offered to Europeana 2021, in 2021 uh, Europeana webinar um, related to storytelling. And you can find here the link. So at the end of this story, there are three possible endings. You get caught by the principal, you join an underground project organization, or you simply follow the rules and everything goes fine in the evening. So the story was very welcome. Um, the audience dates for Egam's Twitter account raised hugely. And the first Flora Seville tweet generated in time 887,669 impressions by uh, July 2020. So quite an impressive increase. Uh, here we have other statistical dates uh, related to uh, Egam's uh, Twitter account, uh, we can see there are 60,141 engagements and 537 likes. And now, uh, when we have to talk about what was fictional and what was um, uh, real, uh, even though Flora Seville is a fictional character, teachers and classes are accurate, as is the principal, Miss Higgins, depicted in the right photo. And so are the buildings and the campus position, uh, which were presented as they looked at the moment of the story in 1987. And since we are talking about local history, this story offers uh, and offered the, the audience a lot of interesting uh, details about historical characters, historical buildings, and even historical, lo local historical important moments. So the um, user feels uh, really immersed in the uh, context of that, the historical context of that time. So going back to our uh, task force group and our um, work there, how did we make the analysis of this storytelling format? Uh, we used Europeana's impact uh, playbook uh, empathy map, um, which is a very useful uh, tool to analyze the audience engagement. And it, uh, we used it because it helped us identify the emotional engagement we felt as users. And to uh, better discuss how the storytelling experience made us feel that way. And in the end, we get a better understanding of our audience engagement. 
at the end of the work, this is how the empathy map looked like. So we agreed that uh, this story makes you want to visit the building and learn more about it, for instance, and that is a concise, easy to navigate, easy to capture someone's attention story. Uh, we, <laughs> we were amused, entertained, engaged, intrigued, and so on. So we had a very interesting discussion about this uh, story which uh, in our opinion was successful because it gamifies an experience that we all could relate to and it uses an, ex an accessible successful language personal but also informal direct evocative and the story brings the joy of discovery and maintains curiosity of the user so in fact it engages audience on a personal and emotional level which is very important for a story so uh, we produced um, our recommendation uh, document uh, has more than 140 pages but we also uh, developed um, seven tips for a successful story Digital cultural heritage collections are amazing. There's so much to explore. So, how do you make sure that the stories you tell through your blogs, exhibitions, events, social media and apps really capture the imaginations of your audience? Here are seven tips to help. Histórias pessoais trazem o passado para a vida. Pensa como podes apresentar experiências pessoais e mergulhar no significado humano de um evento ou de um objeto. E lembra-te, deves ser sensível aos contextos sociais e culturais das diferentes audiências. Porta alla luce il patrimonio nascosto. Riesci a trovare storie che non sono state raccontate altrove? Considera chi manca nella foto. Cerca gemme nascoste. Le collezioni digitali ne hanno molte. Il tuo pubblico può essere una fonte di idee e anche i tuoi collaboratori? Digitale culturali collezioni sono un geweldige bron per beeld. Onderbreek lange teksten of verhalen met afbeeldingen, video's of audiofragmenten. Gebruik hoge kwaliteit afbeeldingen en nodig mensen uit om erop in te zoomen en nieuwe dingen te ontdekken. Experimenteer en speel. De proskalese de tussen de schijf de saas, se ena, programmatisme no taxi. Epices, diploïe gesisas, prefinaïne apli, ovos etsi oste... Jede Geschichte braucht eine Handlung. Gibt es ein besonderes Bild, Zeichen oder ein Ereignis, das den Kern deiner Erzählung gut beschreibt? Verbinde die Details deines Themas miteinander zu einem großen Ganzen. Es ist wirklich so, persönliche Geschichten und gut ausgewählte Bilder sind sehr hilfreich. Le storie relative al patrimonio culturale devono essere basate sui fatti, ma non temere di utilizzare parole, immaginari o approcci descrittivi ed evocativi. Invita lo spettatore ad utilizzare la sua immaginazione, prende in considerazione tutti i sensi. Audio e video possono essere il mando di supporto e divertiti.